What's up guys, it's Tusk here and today I thought I'd show you some pretty significant tips that you can use to actually min-max your style and effectively get achievements as soon as possible. So without any further ado, let's get right into the video. So the first trick I'm going to show you is, as you can see, we're just a single count in you here in Normandy. Now, if you want to notice something here, and we go to wanting to change this, what you'll notice is that we can't change this uh, this building. So say we wanted to build something else here. Say it was farmland and the AI decided not to build any of the, you know, the powerful farmland uh, buildings. What we can actually do, and this is also something I would highly recommend, especially if you're a tiny wee county like this, is you can literally just revoke their titles. So if we just go to, uh, you know, second crown authority so we can revoke titles, and you see it has no disadvantage except opinion with this guy, and that is irrelevant to us. So we just revoke it. And now all of a sudden we can actually change this building, uh, which mean, allows us to min-max our realm much, much easier. And, so let's say if we just look at our council, so let's see who we've got. So here we have uh, one of our courtiers. We'll just take uh, a guy that has high stewardship. Play it in. And what we can do is we can just grant him here. And now all of a sudden we've got a significantly better steward. And he's one of our powerful vassals, as you can see. Powerful vassal. And he's just chilling in here, and we're getting more gold on income per turn because his stewardship is so high. We're getting 26% more. Um, so this is a, a neat little trick you can use. Another thing you can do, obviously, is you could go for more of a prowess-based so that all your knights are actually your vassals. But, you know, you can do that just by just inviting them. But I'd highly recommend making it so that that means that we actually get more gold income uh, per thing. So this is more of a min-max sort of thing. But that's the first trick I'm going to show you. Now, the next little trick I'm going to show you is, which is some of you, you might now know, I think this one's a little bit more known than the other one. It's that theocracies are by far the best vassal you can have. Uh, I'll show up on the screen in a minute. But basically, uh, the higher amount of uh, devotion you have, the higher level it has, the more levies and, and gold you can get. And it goes all the way up to over 50%, I think it is. It's 50% gold and 55% levies or the other way around. And uh, basically what this allows you to do is that uh, th th this is far greater than any other uh, form of uh, government there is. Except tribal, I'm pretty sure. But then tribal, obviously, each county is worth less. So if we go uh, down, we'll see like, like over here, 10% contribution and 25% uh, levies. And compare that to what was there. You can see that even, up, even if we go up here, 35 and then 50% levies. It's very unlikely we're going to be able to actually get these because of the actual penalties we get. But even if we go for extortionate and gold, we can only get a maximum of 25% of this unless we go like for the extra gold and I think it's this one in Scootage, right? But this is nothing compared to what we could get from a theocracy. So what I highly recommend, if you see these little uh, counties here where the actual capital building is the temples, you can just give uh, like actual vassals of these and then whenever uh, they become like rebellious just imprison them and then you can revoke their titles or you can just uh, banish them and then once you banish them you actually get their gold and uh, after that's done and say they have a massive mad territory um, then they will just replace with someone else like this see and now we have a you could argue a better person or whatever and this pretty much means that you get the best amount of uh, income for your the actual land that you have. So generally speaking, you want your vassals to be theocracies. So the next tip I wanted to show you is, was how to get a republic as a large vassal. So what you might want to notice is that if we have a feudal vassal, our temp, we get 10% gold income from that vassal, which is pretty insignificant. And even if we increase it, it only goes up to 15%, which really isn't that much. Now, this is, can be quite irritating because gold is far more valuable at the start of the game than levies are um generally because you know um gold is far more flexible and men arms are just better than levies in every way so what you can actually do is if you just click on your your uh, mayor and just grant them the actual title it actually turns the entire county into a republic and now this guy if we just go and find him we just go to our uh, well, not there we go to our fossils we go to republics and then we find him, and we can see that he gives us 15% of our income. Now, the only reason he's given 15% is because he's not our rightful liege, which is fine, but he will be over time, obviously. Um, but it's still 5% more gold income rather than levies. So if you want to maximize your gold income, so if you're playing that gold heavy style with stewardship, for example, this is definitely something you're going to want to do, as this is way better, and obviously 
try and get someone who is high in stewardship. So using the first tip to get something like this over here with really high stewardship, and then you can give them all the titles that you can't fit in your domain limit, which is what I would argue is the best solution for this. Now, the next tip I'm gonna show you is, is much more about the geography of the map than anything else. So when selecting where you're gonna start, it's important to recognize where special buildings and gold actually is. And the more gold you can get, you know, the better your campaign's gonna go, especially if you're trying to get achievements. So uh, I'll put a map on the screen right now of where all the mines are. It's the one you, sh you should definitely prioritize. And also cathedrals, depending on your religion. So obviously there's different areas where you can build different things. Like obviously these are all different cathedrals you can build for Catholics and then Orthodox and then Muslim, etc. And actually knowing where these are and starting around them is definitely an advantage to take. Even if you don't start there, Understanding, say if you started in Naples, that you can conquer just this place really easily at the start of the game and get an extra three gold a month, it's huge. Because this county is far more valuable than probably every other county in Sicily um, until you get uh, a more developed land. So it's important to recognize uh, where these places are. Like for example, if we go over to Kent, you can see that there's an extremely powerful cathedral here that gives three gold a month. So understanding the geography of the map can definitely change your game to go. Uh, definitely a very powerful tip to take into consideration. Now another tip I would like to suggest is getting some of that sweet sweet renown as soon as possible. So if you start as a count you'll notice that you really don't get much renown it's about 0.25 yeah, 0.25 per count and you can see I think it's my sister. My sister is married to a count so she's getting 0.2. So right now we're getting 0.57 renown. Now if we were to marry our, our sister we married her to Venice so let's say we managed to pick up this a desirable match which is a huge advantage that that would mean that we can actually get another 0.8 renown more than doubling our renown income and obviously pizza exists in this game as well so as when they die and then the next person comes in because it's a republic we could also marry our, our another daughter or sister to them and then we get another 0.8 renown but another thing you may want to look out for is look out for places that have a small amount of area but a, like a good title so crete another kingdom here. So if we can actually conquer this or somehow conquer it, say we swear, we managed to like conquer some of Sicily and then swear fealty to the Byzantine, then we could actually conquer this bit and then that would give us another area for renown. Or we could do the same with Cyprus. Like these little areas with kingdoms, uh, we could actually take them over. Or Sardinia, we just need this little duchy here and then we can make the actual kingdom. It's very barely, any, like you barely need anything to actually make the actual kingdom itself. We just need five. So, Looking at these little things to get maximize your renown as much as possible is a huge advantage and I highly recommend doing it. So another thing I wanted to show you was the advantage of starting in the Viscophic sort of area. So if your cultures, if you're Ossetan, your Aragonese and Calonic, Basque, etc. Or even just starting as one of these different cultures. And the main reason for that is this specific technology here. If we just look at it, I'll oh, just click on that. And what you'll see is we get Viscophic codes, which allows us to enact high partition. Now this can be done straight away in 867 as well. So that means we can have high partition straight from 867 with these specific cultures. This is why I absolutely love these uh, cultures. They give an absolutely enormous advantage uh, at the start of the game uh, compared to many of the others, except maybe Norris, because Norris gets such powerful troops. But this means that we will always get the lion's share. So that means building an actual empire is significantly easier uh, than it would be otherwise, especially with Confederate partition, which just shatters your entire realm. So what I would highly recommend is that either you start as one of these or eventually progress to them, because if you move across, you can see that we definitely don't have um, uh, Heldry, so so we don't have like high partition. We're nowhere near the high medieval age, and yet we have uh, high partition, and yet we're French. So we manage, as long as you actually enact it while you're one of these four different cultures, it will stay there forever and now you even though we're french we still have high partition so i would highly recommend this is a very best big advantage you can use to build an empire so what yeah. you might do at the start of the game is usually you'll click on increase the currency development in your capital but i would actually recommend as long as you know where you are to not do this and instead put it where a university might be so we know in england here that oxford and cambridge both have universities over time but you need 40 development to actually build them so i would highly recommend look at whatever one they're both the same here so it doesn't really matter but we can see that this gives uh this is absolutely fine and this one absolutely fine so these give no disadvantage to actual development so we just i would actually recommend putting it on oxford 
and then slowly it'll build over time. And I'll put a map in the screen of all the universities in the world, uh, in the game so far. And uh, I remember that some, so you have some in England, you have some in Italy, and places like that, etc. And I would highly recommend doing that at the start of the game, because once you have a university, it dramatically increases the chances of getting a better, better education. And if you have the knighthood uh, trait, you can get an actual martial advantage where they get like extra prowess. So again, huge advantage uh, towards that as well. Now, one of the last tips I would suggest is that for your daughters, try and marry them. Uh, obviously, this is already done by the AI, but try and marry them in a matrilineal marriage. Now, not only does this mean you'll get more members of your house, now sometimes they just don't have children uh, unless they have land, so you might want to give their husbands land so that they can actually uh, produce children, which then increases the amount of renown because you'll have more members, right? And then there's also the higher chance that they will eventually, you know, maybe get given some land when they start exploring the world, etc. But also, it means that the actual titles that you have, so when you die, every single one of your children gets a claim, but and then their grandchildren will get an unpressed claim. And that means, but at least, say some disaster does happen, at least then the actual claims are still almost always going to be in within your house and your dynasty and your name, so that at least there's no other uh, house or dynasty vying for power over your titles. And that definitely helps secure those titles, especially if you're one of those, uh, if you're trying to actually gain renown. So what you might do is you might, you know, create this uh, Denmark and then you might, over time, you might move. And then before you know it, you're like, you know what, I'm going to actually start building up in France. And that's where I'm actually going to play from as my main place. But because I started in Denmark uh, and almost all of my, the only the only people with that claim on Denmark are of my dynasty, that means that most likely the AI will be able to hold Denmark for a long period of time. Extended from that, I would actually suggest tracking. So instead of doing this method where you just, you know, go by this method and then just look at who you can marry and, you know, etc. like that, right? I would actually recommend, especially as the game progresses, you click on the character you have, go by their heir, and then they what they might have is they might have children. So if we look at, let's say someone older, let's go by Prince Robert the Old, we see that he has grandchildren and he has no actual uh, title. So if we go here, we can see they accept the exception that they sorry the actual uh, they have no pretty much no negatives of actually accepting it's a minus 20 for matrilineal which is pretty much negligible because the character that here doesn't actually own any land whereas if i was to try and marry him it would be significantly harder because he's the actual heir i think even for him it would be quite difficult as well i oh, know it's the same that's fine but it's important so what i would highly, highly suggest is that if you're really trying to get marry into a kingdom title etc then i would suggest either marrying the second son or even so you have tons of daughters like maybe five different daughters marry the grandchildren marry the the brothers etc and make sure they're in your house it's much better to have matrilineal marriages not only because it'll increase your renown because you have more dynasty members but also because it just means that you'll have uh, more likely to get more renown because they'll actually get the, the kingdom titles and the kingdom titles will be in your name so the last thing I wanted to show you is, was, even though it's a bit more obvious, it is extremely important to stress because this is probably one of the biggest advantages you can do is if you're playing, starting off as a smaller character, is I would highly, highly suggest swearing fealty to your neighboring lead. So here we can go by low uh, feudal obligations. So we barely pay anything, 2.5% taxes, 10% levies. And then we swear fealty, which is pretty much insignificant. And then what we can do is we can go to modify a feudal contract we go by high because we don't really care about levies and then we go by guaranteed council rights and because they're uh we can even see that our character right here is absolutely terrible like we couldn't ask for lower stats basically and what we can do now is we can just go to this demand council position sure and now all of a sudden we're getting an extremely higher amount even though we're not rightful leads we're getting significantly more income just purely by the, by the fact that we get a flat increase of, uh, let me just go back here, liege. We got flat entries of three gold and it reduces the cost of all buildings we have. And we get 20% more domain taxes. It's absolutely ridiculous. And even though we are insightful thinker, we get a 20% increase, but we also now, because we're the steward for 25 years, we could now, if we wanted to, just go down the stewardship focus because we get exactly the same experience increase. Uh, so I would highly suggest <laughs> uh, going down this route. Uh, every single game if you're near this sort of thing. Being independent is far more overrated than people realize until you start getting a 
you know more developed land and you actually start building upon it but from the start once before you've even like done anything just swear fealty especially if it's an empire because you get extremely large benefits as we can see here this is task from the future here just to let you know that you might want to make a duchy first because otherwise just in this situation as an example we've sweared fealty to the holy roman empire so that most likely means he's going to make us a vassal of angria which we really don't want because then we only get one gold per month instead of three so i'd highly recommend that you make a duchy first that you don't have to you know not push into anyone's vassal and instead you're the vassal of the holy roman empire so you're guaranteed the three gold income per month it's less obviously if you're a kingdom it goes down to two gold per month but when it's an empire it's always worth it so for example if you're playing in serbia or somewhere along here get independence from him and just immediately swear fealty to the byzantine it's significantly better uh, or even try and get hungry to make carpathia you know something along those lines it's almost always better to be a lee uh, to be a vassal of something uh, early on than it is to be independent so thanks very much for watching and i'll see you guys in the next one